Over the course of the past couple months, we've been tracing the life of Jesus through the Gospel of Mark. We've been paying close attention to the things that, that Jesus does, which point to the kingdom. And we pay even closer attention to the things that, that Jesus says, particularly with regards to uh, the cost of discipleship, or in other words, uh, taking up our cross and following him. And so last week, you'll remember, we talked about Jesus' summary of the Old Testament law. And when asked which is the greatest commandment, he answered, uh, to love the Lord your God. But, but that wasn't all. He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Um, it seems like an all or nothing proposition. Again, thinking back a, a few weeks when we talked about the, the story of the rich young ruler, uh, he asks Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And what does Jesus say? He says, go and sell all your possessions and come and follow me. Again, it's an all or nothing proposition. And today we come to this, this beautiful account of a woman who offers a, a love gift to Jesus, pouring out an entire jar of perfume upon his head. And again, it's a situation where she doesn't just uncork it and uh, pour a couple of drops on Jesus as a, as a symbolic gesture. No, she, she breaks the jar and pours the whole thing over Jesus' head. And so we're going to talk about that story today a little bit. And the first thing I want to talk about is uh, putting it into some context. We read in verse 1, that the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. And so we are moving into this celebration that, that God's people observed every single year, the celebration of the Passover. Now, just as a reminder of what the Passover is, the Passover had been celebrated for generation after generation, tracing itself all the way back to the book of Exodus where God uh, rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. And many of you will remember how that story culminated with God commanding the people, each household, to slaughter and sacrifice a lamb and to put some of that lamb's blood on the doorposts so that when the angel of death moved through Egypt, killing the firstborn of the Egyptians, he would pass over the houses of God's people that he had chosen to rescue through his servant Moses. Now, the Passover that Jesus is only two days away from in uh, Mark chapter 14, is the biggest, most significant Passover that, that had ever been celebrated to that point and, and that has ever been celebrated since. Because uh, on this Passover, the Lamb of God was going to be slaughtered and his uh, blood would open the way of salvation for all human beings. And so this is what we're looking at coming into this story. This is the context. And Jesus at this point sees his death very clearly. Now, I also want to look at how this passage is framed. Because as I said before, it's a, it's a beautiful story. It's a, a beautiful story of this woman uh, giving a love gift. Um, this expression that, that was generous and, and extravagant and, and self-sacrificial is framed on either end by uh, something a bit more shadowy. Let me just remind you verses 1 and 2. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. 
but not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. Now, Jesus had been getting under the skin of the the Pharisees and the the teachers of the law for uh, many months now. But the time had come in their minds that, that they needed now to get rid of Jesus once and for all. Now, of course, this is also God's sovereign plan. God is completely in control of this situation. But I just want to point out that things are coming to a head. And then looking to the end of the passage that we read, um, we read of Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, who went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. And of course, they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. And so we are coming very, very close to the cross. Jesus is nearing his death, and his death now fills his horizon, and his death is imminent, only days away. And so it is in light of that that we understand the rest of this account. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Now, I want to talk about this in, in three different movements or, or sections. And the, the first section is uh, love poured out. The second section, I, I want to talk about uh, love questioned. And in the third section, I want to talk about uh, love betrayed. And so this brings us into that first section, love poured out, where we can hold up the, the act of this woman and see uh, what Jesus has to say about it, how Jesus understands it, and how we too should understand it. Now, in the Gospel of John, this uh, unnamed woman here in Mark is actually given the name, and we find that this is actually Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And so this is a woman that has a special relationship with Jesus. She knows Jesus well. Jesus has spent time with her. And so uh, this isn't just some random person coming in and doing an extravagant and yet uh, really pretty meaningless thing. No, this anointing with perfume is very significant. And it finds deeper significance actually in two ways. Uh, One way that we understand scripturally and the other way that's actually mentioned here in the text. So let me just briefly uh, tell you the significance. Uh, Biblically, the word Messiah actually means anointed one. And so Mary's anointing of Jesus with this perfume is yet another acknowledgement, another confirmation that Jesus truly is the Messiah. And being the Messiah comes with it all of this other freight from the Old Testament, all of the promises of redemption, all of the prophecies of a coming Lord and King, all of the anticipation of the Old Testament messianically is pointed toward Christ. And it's as if Mary is is highlighting this and saying this is, is the one. Now, how extensively she understood that, we don't know, but her act speaks volumes. The other deeper significance of this anointing of Jesus with uh, perfume is found right here in the text when Jesus says a little bit later on, defending the woman, She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. And so Jesus, as I said, knows what's in store. He sees the cross. He sees his death. He sees his burial. And you'll remember how that all went down. 
because when they buried Jesus, they were coming up on the Sabbath, and so they didn't have time to adequately prepare the body. That's why on Easter Sunday, the day after the Sabbath, the women were found going to the tomb to, to do that work that should have been done before Jesus went into the tomb. But here, Jesus points to his death and burial once again and said that this is the anointing that I will receive. What Mary did was beautiful and generous and extravagant. And Jesus was pleased. Look, a jar of perfume that cost an entire year's wages was a precious, precious possession. Probably the most precious possession that Mary had. That of the, the most worth, at least materially. And as I said, she wasn't satisfied with just popping the cork and, and doing some kind of a symbolic couple of drops on Jesus' head. She uh, broke the jar. She broke the jar and poured it over Jesus' head. As though, you know, she was, she was taking a step, an all or nothing step. I mean, breaking the jar, there was no coming back from that. And so she was all in for Jesus. This was an expression, not just deep in significance, but, but deep in terms of significance in her own heart. This is a devoted follower of Jesus doing what she could to express that love and devotion. So it's a bit surprising that she takes criticism for this act. And so now we move into the section, uh, love questioned. We have love poured out and now we have that love questioned. Some of those present, it says, were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor and they rebuked her harshly. And so what she did was not looked on kindly by those that were present. And let's be honest with ourselves. We are a practical and pragmatic and prudent people. Perhaps some of us would have viewed this scene in exactly the same way. They said, why this waste? Why would you bust the jar and pour it all over his head? That could have been sold and the money uh, used to, to help people in need. On the surface, it seems like a legitimate criticism. But uh, I am almost certain that the people uh, saying these words didn't yet recognize the true person of Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior, as the Redeemer, as the King. These were people uh, who understood a little bit of what Jesus taught, and some of them were probably um, thinking that by uh, criticizing Mary in that way that they might get a pat on the back from Jesus because Jesus, of course, cared deeply about those who were poor, those who were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. But in this situation, those that criticized didn't get it. And Mary did. And so Jesus responds pretty angrily, actually. He says, leave her alone. She has done a beautiful thing. And he says, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. So Jesus is telling them right here again that he was going to have to suffer and to die. And he's also telling them who he is, the Messiah, the, the coming one, the one that everyone had been waiting for. But love for Jesus and expressions of devotion are always going to be criticized because the fact is not everybody gets it. Not everybody got it then, and not everybody gets it today. So we move on to the last movement. 
love betrayed. And I already read this about Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, one of the 12 disciples who went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them, and they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Judas was one of those people that was, you know, uh, as close to Jesus almost as someone could get. And even he didn't get it. He was ready to betray his rabbi, his teacher, his master, his Lord. And so it is today. Jesus says to us, I, through my death, offer you salvation and reconciliation with God. And the fact is, the choice then is up to us, whether we want to accept that or not. Now, the Holy Spirit works in our hearts, and and those who are elect by God will, will have within themselves the ability to respond with faith. But then there are those that will respond with criticism and with anger and even with violence. But what I want to look at today is circling back to that all or nothing proposition that we've been encountering all through the gospel of Mark. Mary was not satisfied with just a couple of drops of her precious perfume. She broke the jar. She went all the way. She uh, demonstrated that she was all in for Jesus. Last week, when we looked at the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. It's an all or nothing proposition. And I'm here to tell you that what what Mary does here with regard to taking what's most precious to her and, and breaking the jar and pouring it on Jesus' head, it, it's a pale reflection. And it's a pale reflection of what God himself has done for us in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, the most precious thing to the Father. He gave up to the world. He gave up to suffering. He gave up to die so that we could share in that love, so that we could share in that great love that is poured out from Father to Son and Son to Spirit and Spirit to Father in this everlasting dance of the triune God. Jesus sacrificed. The Father sacrificed his Son so that we could join in that dance. And so as we come into Palm Sunday and then into Holy Week and Easter, Let's not forget the great sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Let's not forget that that sacrifice points directly to uh, the deepest love of God the Father for us, his sons and daughters. And let's not forget that as sons and daughters of the living God through faith in Jesus Christ, we are called to be all in. We are called to make God and his son Jesus Christ the most precious thing in our lives. Brothers and sisters, I am happy to do that. And I hope you are too. Amen.